Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library. I am so excited to introduce this virtual event with Rebecca Rag Sykes presenting her book Kindred Neanderthal Life, Love, Death and Art in conversation with Dr. Julie Lawrence. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Although summer is here, we do have a few more events in the works for the remainder of the summer before kicking off one of our busiest fall seasons. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter, or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our Science Research Public Lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This afternoon's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk today, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Kindred on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like today's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. Now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Rebecca Rag Sykes is an honorary fellow at the School of Archaeology, Classics, and Egyptology at the University of Liverpool. She regularly writes for the popular media, including the Scientific American and Guardian Science blogs. <clears throat> and she is also co-founder of the influential Trowel Blazers Project, which highlights women archaeologists, paleontologists, and geologists through innovative outreach and collaboration. Today, she is joining conversation by Dr. Julie Lawrence, a paleoanthropologist, historian of science, and currently a college fellow at Harvard's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. Her work largely focuses on the evolution of the human face from changes 4 million years ago in the teeth and faces of our first upright ancestors to understanding the diversity of facial forms today. This afternoon, Rebecca and Julie have joined us for a discussion of Kindred, Rebecca's essential guide to a misunderstood bygone species, which Brian Cox calls beautiful, evocative, and authoritative. Based on the author's firsthand experience at the cutting edge of Paleolithic research and theory, this book offers the first full picture we have of Neanderthals, challenging some of our most pernicious portrayals, celebrating amazing new discoveries, and giving us rare glimpses into how these early hominins lived, died, and contributed to our own human story. We've got a lot to learn this afternoon, so without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Rebecca and Julie. Are we on? <laughs> yeah, okay. you are on. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Hello everyone. I can't see it properly. Oh, there we are. There we are. I can see everyone. Hi. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be um to be hosted today, especially um by an independent um bookshop. Um I think it's just been indie book store week either in the US or the UK one or the other um so yeah it's it's really nice to to be here and 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 give a talk um or have a conversation um in this in this context so yeah really looking forward to hearing more about the background on your book and uh to hear more about your ideas of science communication and writing um so I don't know if you want to begin with uh, a discussion of how the book came about and how it's been received very well received <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean like right now um i i can, I can hold it up so right now this is the us edition of the the paperback which is just just out in fact um and so this is now come out um nearly two years after the initial publication so it's actually <clears throat> quite wonderful and um lovely to still be talking to people um about about the book um this far this far on from it as it were um but yeah where did it like where did it come from um the origin of the book really um 
I guess it has to go back to just like a lot of people who who are in archaeology I suppose and and yeah it's it's a childhood interest for sure um I think whether you're into paleontology or archaeology I think that's that's quite common um in terms of something that like stretches back into our own past as as individuals actually um and I was always really drawn to visiting old sites and um, like with my family um and in fact I've just been to to France um I was leading an archaeological tour for new scientists um and included on the tour was uh, one of the sites that I remember visiting when I was a child and um, the cave at uh, Peshmer so this is a um a Gravettian uh parietal art painted um cave um, in the southwest of France um and it was really nice to be back actually because it just reminded me of how um how formative actually visiting those kind of sites as well as like going to castles and, and things like this where it's more like a a broader heritage context um where you can sort of imagine yourself there a little bit more easily because it's it's more recent um, but actually going to really ancient places when I was quite young and physically being inside caves as well. Um, I think that was definitely a trigger for what was going to emerge a bit later as an academic career focus um, on Neanderthals. So I think the the real origins of the book are quite, <laughs> quite deep and then it's evolved through through an interest in writing um, and an academic career that focused in from broader, broader archaeology, broader prehistory, and then more and more towards the Neanderthals as I went from undergraduate to master's to PhD. Um, and then alongside that, I began to, I guess, realise that something that was really important to me was sharing and communication of knowledge about archaeology as well. So that's basically the motivation for, for the book yeah and the thing about the, this kind of book is that you can bring together both your passion for the subject and the scope of all the scientific facts and you do that really well you know throughout each chapter you begin with a lot of imagery and you really set the scene for the individual topics um i think this kind of book is really important for someone like me a scientist who hasn't written their own uh, popular science book to read for us to remind ourselves of the importance of science communication and you know we all have I, I think the majority of us have a passion like I have a passion I'm in love with Australopithecus for the, my own reasons you know um and we kind of set that aside most of the time when we give our scientific talks or we write our scientific papers and it's really nice that through these books we can kind of combine those two parts of things um, yeah absolutely I mean it the the writing of this book was um kind of intended to be like a second book actually um in that I was initially speaking with um with the publishers which was uh, Bloomsbury Sigma um so it's like the popular science imprint of the, the the bigger Bloomsbury publishers and um initially um and this is this is an argument for the career relevance of social media in that they first made contact with me through twitter um quite some time ago like literally 10 years ago in fact actually in 2012 um and my editor was interested in talking to me about maybe writing a book about birds and humanity in prehistory and sort of the relations of, of humans and birds and things and that was partly because um I was writing generally about prehistory and I had just started to um, kind of, yeah, contribute um, sort of to science blogs and things like this. So I was sort of just starting to, to experiment with doing that. Um, and and he knew that I really liked just bird watching anyway. <laughs> um, and it was like a cool topic. Um, but for, for just various reasons, that didn't that didn't happen initially. And um, although I had the contract for it, and then so we switched and and he said, well, why don't you just do the Neanderthal one first? Um, and although it was like really intimidating because A, it's a very big topic, but also somehow it being closer to my actual area of expertise made it 
more intimidating I don't actually know why it should it shouldn't be that way around but it was um and yes but once I got over it and I was like yeah okay we're gonna do it um then I kind of just like I don't know felt like my appetite for it rising and I was just like yeah I want to get my teeth into this and just go for it and it is yeah like when you when you when you say about the the need to kind of mix or um yeah blend make something new out of your one's experience writing academically and another kind of writing um I started doing that from the beginning because I'm pretty sure that the first stuff that I wrote um was one of the chapter introductions which are um they're kind of like small narrative um like vignettes that I've tried to be open each chapter with they're largely about sort of set in the past in like the Neanderthal world but not all of them um and it's kind of like a like a distilled version of some of the themes in the chapters or particular scenes um and that also was quite um nerve-wracking to write like that or at least because I have written kind of things like that for a long time and poetry and stuff but I hadn't shared it <laughs> um so the idea of sharing and and putting that in was also quite um a little bit scary but obviously I wanted to because that was the very first thing I started to do and, and that was like my way in to how I was going to structure the book as well um in terms of just thinking about which scenes from the the mass of archaeological data and uh, which scenes actually jumped out at me as a researcher and as somebody just interested in in the past so yeah there was there was a need to kind of like knit those two things together yeah I definitely get your the, the closer it is to your own subject and what you think you should be the expert in I think the more critical you are of every comment you make you know because you know all the caveats and you know all the mm. or maybe but if I and then you always want to explain it a bit further and um so I I can see how that's difficult and also reading it reading the book it was always I was thinking how do you choose what facts <laughs> to put in how do you choose which especially when you're so fascinated by it and you know so much about it how do you choose in a way that keeps it enough detail but not you know getting bogged down and ending up with writer's block uh well I mean the honest answer is that um I put way more in initially than has ended up in the book so the yeah like the 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 kind of the final manuscript um oh like nine months or something before I submitted it was just vast like over two hundred thousand words it's crazy huge 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 and it was because I was struggling to um step outside of that safety that you have when you write scientific articles where you're like I'm going to put everything in I'm going to put all the examples I know and you know put all these things up in order to create a good foundation to make an argument but you can't do that in a book like this um and so I did realize that when I was when I was happy with the structure of the book and I really realized the things I was trying to say within the chapters but also as like a thread going between the different chapters once I had really um I guess um made myself happy that that was secure then I was able to sort of slice away a little bit of the the contextual stuff um in terms of getting rid of some of the sites that I was mentioning because actually I didn't need to because my main point was being made by another site that was already in there that had abundant information already so um yeah so it was just I, I think it was a case of learning how to um <clears throat> How to be not so much like brutal with your own writing but just to yeah be more confident I suppose about the point that you're making being um being sufficiently communicated already with just a few points um but also and and I have said this before in in some talks that I've given relating to science writing and stuff like this um you know to, br to bring it up again um twitter's usefulness has also been enforcing me 
over years of using it to distill language as well and make one's point in few characters and actually learn how to rearrange your sentence structure or you know just get it down a little bit more um to the point um so actually there has there has been some kind of training element in there as well <laughs> yeah and, and the other thing that i noticed and i i mean i enjoy a good footnote is that you make very good use of footnotes in your book to give those kind of little extra details and interesting points um which i think is really nice you know there's that little bit more detail is that something that you had in originally and then you're like oh I, I still want to include it but it doesn't quite fit with the flow or um yeah I, I did get I got rid of quite a lot of footnotes as well or I just decided no they've got to go in the text because it was becoming too um yeah it was just going to be like too much and I, I'm not sort of like a, a fan of enormous footnotes really um but yeah I think in in some instances if it's just a completely weird fact but it's kind of intriguing then I wanted to to put it in um well, as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um and the other I mean the other thing that why I really like the book um as a scientist reading it even though it's not particularly in my field I'm, I deal with much older fossil part of the fossil record um it's just the explanation of site formation and things like taphonomy that you included so nicely um which are really important things for us to get across in terms of some of the, the things that are missing, but not necessarily. So some of the doubts that we have, because they're pure scientific doubts. And I think that's something that I, I'm always concerned about and it's important is to be able to acknowledge and express the scientific doubts we have about our own topics, what we don't know, but in a way that doesn't fuel like militant skeptics to say, well, if they don't know, then it can't be, <laughs> be true I don't know if you've had any kind of experiences with um well I mean I I would never believe an author who says they don't read all of their reviews and I have read a lot of reviews um <clears throat> not just like you know written reviews in in articles or whatever but you know reviews from from everyday readers and stuff on Amazon or Goodreads and I I do read them and um for the most part I think people <clears throat> or general readers um appreciated what I was trying to do which was to explain how archaeology works I didn't want to actually put lots of time and effort into explaining how methods of analysis work like radiocarbon or other dating stuff or you know genetics I didn't actually want to use up words to do that because there was so much to say already so instead I wanted to more um, communicate to people you know what is the thought process behind archaeology what is the nature of the record and how far can we sort of stretch that data that we can get out um, of the ground um, and how far can we stretch that to, to make a point um, or to to make a claim um, and I wanted people to understand why I was claiming some things or why I was communicating what other researchers have, have claimed and on what basis um, and sort of help people see the weighing up that goes on all the time whenever we find things, um, you know, and, and sort of understand that in some sites and in some contexts or discoveries it's so clear you know your interpretation is 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 easy you know in a sense um whereas in in other cases um and for particular sort of aspects of behavioral patterning you need to take many different fragmentary aspects all of which have their own caveats and then kind of formulate them into a broader sort of tapestry kind of argument and so I, I wanted people to to understand the confidence with which archaeologists um can make those kind of claims basically um <clears throat> but yeah I mean some some people who who read it are still just like uh you know it's all just made up of fragments you know the paleolithic you can't say anything it's like okay well you know it is what it is we don't have big temples with inscriptions and stuff on them that is not what we have and we're never going to have that so 
if that's the basis of what we have we've got to work with it or just say nothing <laughs> um so I think yeah I think it depends on what your attitude is to sort of historical comment or, or the richness of of the record and what one can say in any period from archaeology basically and um, so yeah hope hopefully it's it's a fair depiction of of how how we work in in the discipline yeah it's nice with like the one example of what neanderthals ate you know something that should be so simple that is so complex and i think you nicely describe how you know, so many different aspects that it's not only asking what did Neanderthals as if they were one group of people in a certain snapshot of time, but trying to take into perspective the, the depths of how long they were around and how broad their geographical range was. And, and just the idea of knowing what something ate, like even now what modern humans eat, it depends on, you know, there's such a rich variety that yeah. it's this kind of question that a lot mm. of people are, oh, well, if you don't even know that, you know, how can you know more complex things? But I think yeah, that's... I mean, the thing about like the eating is quite fun because, um, yeah, like diet and and also like with teeth, like if I if I'm writing an article um, in general about Neanderthals, you know, like for a public audience, then diet and 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 teeth are really really excellent ways to communicate how mind boggling it is in in modern archaeology all the different methods that we actually have to address those questions now um it, there's so many different forms of data that we can draw on and yes they are individually sometimes partial or um you know come with with some bias or something but it's i think what what i was hoping to to communicate to, to to general readers who maybe knew a bit about Neanderthals or a bit about prehistory was just how much there is, how much data we actually have, um, almost too much, you know, to, to be able to write an entire chapter about diet. I mean, as I say, I cut out loads about, about it, even in this chapter, which is quite a big chapter in the book. Um, and it, I wanted to sort of, I guess, really help people understand the 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 wealth of information that there is available to you as a as a specialist in all the scientific literature which is not easily accessible to people outside the field who, who are not working or who who don't have access to to journals and things um you know that, that allow us to be able to say well yes the, the neanderthal diet was actually really quite um varied and it did depend on where they lived and and all of these different things and that they could be very choosy about stuff and you know the fact we can actually say anything like that is really quite amazing and when you when you think about it um so now i think i think it's the diet and and the teeth and also it's like you say it's it's a thing that people can relate to um quite easily because it's so important you know we we have multiple meals a day and they're important um, not just for our calorific needs otherwise we would eat like the food that astronauts eat you know just stuff in a packet and squeeze it into your mouth it's nothing like that it's a sensory sensual part of being a human um, and I wanted to put, to make that point as well that even though there's all of these very baseline sort of questions we have about diet you know how much were they eating how many calories were they getting were they focusing on the very marrow rich bones blah 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 that's all really important to understand Neanderthals but then there's also the the side which people can relate to which is the idea that what a Neanderthal might have eaten at any given point in its life if it was from northwestern Europe during a glacial period it's going to be totally different to what they were used to eating in the Mediterranean peninsulas during a warm period so I think people really suddenly go oh yeah that makes, that makes sense, sense. and it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it, it sort of opens up this idea that there were many worlds yeah. in a way that is quite relatable mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm glad you say all of that about teeth and jaws because that's kind of my bread and butter of what I do um I didn't <laughs> ask you to say that um but I feel like you got that across in terms of diet but you also got that across generally the idea of how I mean that's the biggest message I think from the book was that adaptability and variability of Neanderthals and I like how you say it's you know they're not just with the background of ice and mammoths even though we do mm -hmm. love that imagery um just the complexity 
of their lives. And, and the beautiful thing that you say as well is that we have such good representation of all stages of the life of, of a Neanderthal that we don't have for some of the older fossil record. Um, I think that's another thing we talked about is that, you know, if you say something like Homo erectus, which is a very interesting fossil species and has a broad geographical range, but there's something just so much more relatable about Neanderthals. I'm sure you get asked this all the time, like why Neanderthals? Why do you think they're so popular <clears throat> with people? Yeah, um, I mean, it's true. It's I think if people had to sort of name like three hominins, they would probably say Homo erectus, um, maybe Lucy. Um, they, they might not know which Australopithecine it is, but they would know the name Lucy um, and probably Neanderthals. I would say it's probably those three. Mm. Um, but out of all of those, it, it, Neanderthals absolutely still do have this, um, this really strong magnetism for people um, who don't work in the field, you know, just everyday um, people who are interested in, in science or history. Um, and I think it's, to a large extent um, related to two aspects. One is the nature of the, the record that we actually have for Neanderthals. Um, <clears throat> we have, you know, I think it's something like more than 200 sites where we actually have skeletal remains um, and thousands of pieces that, that is overall. Um, you know, some of these are more complete individual skeletons some of them it's just a piece of a jaw or whatever but overall that's actually a really really rich database of of, um, of remains to work with um, and in addition um, we not only have sort of quite a lot of, of remains that represent probably a couple of hundred um, maybe more actual individual Neanderthals but the range over which they are represented in terms of the lifespan is also really impressive. So we have um, we have uh, preterm infants, we have newborns, we have like a couple of months old, we have toddlers, older children, like school age children and teenagers and adults and even individuals that were probably more like elders, although when you get older and older in skeletal terms, it's very hard to actually give specific ages beyond like about sort of 40 or so. Um, so we, ha we have the ability to look at the entire lifespan of Neanderthals. And yeah, they are picked from across different areas geographically and through time, but, but we're, we're able to look at the development of another hominin from birth to death, basically, which is really quite amazing and I don't think we have a record that is that rich for other hominin species not really um so there is there's the nature of of that there's also the fact we just have so much archaeologically that we can say you know all the other all the all the cultural remains um all sorts of of stuff we just have a very rich record and that's partly because Neanderthals are closer in time to us so based on to phonemy, so you know the history of what happens to stuff when it goes into the ground over time essentially the older things are the less chance they have to survive because neanderthals compared to lucy three million years plus neanderthals are much closer in time to us and therefore more of of their material remains has survived anyway um, so we have a really good basis to make all these sort of um discoveries and to to create these narratives about what their life really was like so that's kind of like the science argument but then the other reason why I think that people are so um not attached but they relate to Neanderthals in a really specific way is because of the history of the science of human origins which is um the fact that Neanderthals were the very first hominin species that we actually realized existed um, that we first encountered and so you know they they go back to to the first recognized find which was in 1856 you know so they've been with us for more than 160 years over the entire span of time during which the science of human origins was developing over which we were really being able to understand how old everything was to date things to put all different sort of phases of human existence in order um 
and for, for a long time the Neanderthals were like the stars of the show really and so I think that legacy has continued and woven into that is the fact that because they were the first and you know were deeply shocking in many ways um in a in a social in a moral kind of sense um as to what they the implications that they had for what it meant to be human at all um that sort of framing of them as the the archetypal other has stuck um and they have remained as a handy mirror for us to sort of look at ourselves um and you know sometimes that's that's all we do with them really and it, it filters into to how we understand their whole existence which is a bit unfair um but nonetheless that is that's absolutely still why i think people are um drawn to to understanding not only what they were but also the the way in which we can tell new stories about neanderthals because of how archaeology has evolved people really relate to that as well this idea that that science itself evolves and we're finding new things and you know in some cases it's it's not really hyperbole to say that some finds have overturned ideas about neanderthals or models or assumptions and things like this so i think all of that together is is why like they are like a list mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry homo oh. erectus but <laughs> yeah they're, they're definitely the most popular when i'm teaching undergraduate courses everyone always wants to know about neanderthals and mostly about yeah. interbreeding with them um i think you're right this that they've always been there since we've been telling the human evolutionary story and so they're yeah. the ones we kind of compare ourselves to and i always joke that for me you know it's all too modern i prefer the older <laughs> stuff but i do find it very interesting how people particularly in the media how they interact with the finds on neanderthals mm. because there's both that love of them uh, and there's that you know obsession with what made them vulnerable why did they go extinct could we go extinct if you know, yeah. if there's this, if we're so similar um, there's also, you know, the funny ones, there's the things with genetics where they blame Neanderthals for certain things. Oh. You either blame them for good things that you've inherited or bad things they that you've inherited. They can't do anything right. <laughs> no, and yeah, as you, they're just so popular and I think they're in the news every week. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there is, there is somewhat of an element to, I think Neanderthals are pretty solid clickbait um, in some senses that, you know, that's not to say that any of the research or the science that's done about Neanderthals doesn't have its own value, absolutely does. But I think, you know, newspapers or, or websites or whatever are very well aware that Neanderthals will get people interested and they will want to read that stuff. Um, so um, I think people, yeah, people in the media are quite happy to have a have a Neanderthal story because um, it bumps the science up and, you know, it's it is it is of interest and that that is problematic because like you say sometimes um you know some of the spins on things you're just like well so what you know so so there is a neanderthal link to the covid situation what does that does that give us any medical relevance does it does it help us it, it doesn't actually change anything about what we think about neanderthals it doesn't give us any information about our interactions with neanderthals in the past really it doesn't shift any current policy about covid it's just a factoid and yet it was massive like <laughs> media headlines and, and there was two successive stories on that one was that the neanderthals made it worse and the other one was that they made it you know better so yeah. it ended up being kind of a weird pointless scientific hole you know neanderthals and covid and, and that was it um so that is kind of the downside of 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 this that sometimes i think it's it's difficult to um to contextualize it properly some of the information or, or the new findings or new research to come out about about Neanderthals um, and there is so much all the time you know I mean I, this is true I think in whatever subfield in human evolution you work in like the amount of new papers coming out constantly or conference you know abstracts things that you hear about it's impossible to keep up with all of it um, 
people do want to know about it but it's I think there's a question about how how selective um reporting or promotion of of that work is or is not <laughs> and is that actually helpful to um, people who want to know about Neanderthals in general um and I, I guess I I mean I guess that's that's what I hoped the book would do for people who who undoubtedly constantly hear about Neanderthals in the news and they've picked up the idea that Neanderthals were not quite as stupid as we used to think um <clears throat> but I wanted the book to give people a a context to understand that well what was what did people used to think about Neanderthals what did used to be the evidence for certain kinds of behavior versus what is the evidence now and this new discovery I've just read about how does that fit into what we already know right now about say Neanderthal aesthetics or or, or burial or whatever um so I wanted it to kind of be like a definitive guide to Neanderthals so that people could learn about information in general and and the general picture but also then if if new findings come up and of course it's two years since this was written it it already needs updating <laughs> um you know people could then place that in in context if if they'd read the book yeah I mean that's the thing a lot of people say nowadays is there's fewer textbooks there's fewer monographs because of that reason because things need updating so consistently mm. that people are almost reluctant to do it <clears throat> um but it plays such an important role because you as a scientist, I mean, we talked about in terms of how much science communication is your own responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when there's all these news articles going around to be able to, to tell people, to give them the objective knowledge to then assess these new things that are coming out is, it's a very important thing, but at the same time, uh, with the, the way that our science is structured, having the time to do that is, is quite difficult. You know, setting yeah. aside time to be a science communicator or to yeah, work and, with one. And absolutely, like in terms of how, how individual researchers have to manage this aspect of, um, I guess, public communication or public facing of their work. Um, you know, most of the time, if you are, if you're a researcher in a lab or in a university, um, you are under some pressure, explicit or not, to produce groundbreaking work or work that's going to have media impact because this is what funding bodies require ultimately because if it's public money then it has to be public good and it has to be communicated but that does make it difficult for people um and there is there is some some pressure to kind of you know not hype up but um make everything sound like amazing and, and really cool which it all it is um, but I was what I realized was a real privilege and, and I was very lucky to be able to do was to write a book about Neanderthals without any of that pressure. And it was just what do I think as a researcher is actually really informative about Neanderthals? What are the sites that for me are just jaw dropping or consistently amazing or always useful to go back to because they're so rich and um, you know and I was able to to make those choices on on the basis of um yeah I mean it's my personal view and, and there is always some subjectivity in that because we're all individuals um but I didn't have anybody looking over my shoulder kind of saying you sh should you say that or you know like well what about this new site that's just been found? We need to talk about that. It's like, well, I can make those decisions um, and present something that I think gives the most the most relevant, up to date flavour of of what we can say or what we can't say about Neanderthals in general. Yeah, I think that's a, a very important thing that this book has achieved, and books like it um, because it's something that we're not necessarily given time to do as scientists. And, and they do, we get approached on specific articles, like something comes out and you get asked, well, oh, what's your opinion on this? And, and that's summarized in one line. Um, <laughs> and then you know, yeah. that's your judgment. And uh, that's a lot of pressure and it can be taken out of context. And it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult line to tread to, 
to be responsible for your own science, to comment on other people's science. Mm. Um, but it's something that I think a lot of us really want to do. Um, I mean, I definitely, we've talked about the, in terms of Twitter, I'm, I'm much more of a, a, a quiet scientist. I have less of a, a, an online presence. I realize the importance of it. And I think part of it is that feeling like, oh, well, I'll do that when I feel more secure in, you know, there's sometimes, and, and it's a skill. It's, a, it's very, very much a skill and a personality type to be good at expressing yourself and to have the desire to do that. And I think it should be encouraged and it should be a formal part of our, our jobs of, of being this is that there should be some more of a framework for science communication and dissemination. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the funny thing is, it's not like science communication is just something that we do to people who don't work in science because we do it all the time with our colleagues at conferences and we are all expected if you're in an academic career to actually be able to do that to distill knowledge about your work and create a poster and present that poster to colleagues um maybe in different disciplines if it's an interdisciplinary conference um or to stand up and actually talk about your research and to field questions about it so academics actually are expected to be able to do that but they're hardly ever trained in it <laughs> Um, and yeah, so this is why I, I mean, I definitely feel like in general, um, it would be beneficial to science and to people who work in science um, and to everybody else if there was a, a higher valorization of this as a career path, not an add on or like yeah. a little thing that you you kind of like do in your own time or I'll just leave my writing a blog about my dig to to the weekend or whatever that actually it should be part of the the professional pursuit not just because it's largely funded publicly and you know who are we doing it for um other than our own personal intellectual curiosity and I don't think that's a sufficient reason to, to be allowed to do all this and to have that privilege um you know and as well there's the whole fact that that it is useful to us as researchers to be able to succinctly communicate to to think creatively and you know i i find it such a i feel like i'm in the most incredible wonderful position and i'm very very lucky now to be able to do this full time but to still do some academic stuff and to still collaborate with people but to come up with creative ideas for mixing science with writing with maybe art projects and and music and and stuff like this i have loads of ideas what's really hard is um actually finding structures and and means for these ideas to to be incorporated within um the 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 constrictions that my my colleagues who are still within academia um you know within which they have to work um and i think other fields do this better for example i, I have said before in different talks that kind of like a, a parallel to archaeology in terms of people's passion about it and the public fascination is astronomy and as astronomy um it, like nasa and esa the european space agency they are amazing at sort of public facing stuff at creative aspects and I think archaeology um, in general could could maybe learn something from that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us enjoy it and, and we in this political climate, we need to do it. One of the yeah. things uh, you have a great line in the book where you say about us not just being boffins bumbling around from one idea to another. Um, <laughs> and I think that's that's very important that we need to get that across to the, the wider public. Mm -hmm. I think they they want to move us on to question and answers. Now we have some questions from the. <clears throat> listening audience. Wonderful. Um, so we have quite a few really interesting questions. I'm going to start with this specific one, um, just because it was a term you brought up earlier. Um, someone asked, hi, could you explain site formation a bit for those of us not familiar with the terminology? Um, and, and what you said it was sort of important. And I was just wondering what the importance is of site formation. Yeah, um, so the if you are an archaeologist or um, or a paleontologist, so like a dinosaur researcher as well, um, the term taphonomy 
is really important to you. Um, and that basically means um, when you excavate a site, you can't just sort of dig it. Um, you have to have to know how that site formed so that you can understand exactly what it is you're excavating. So, you know, if you have a one layer um, and it's very thin and it's full of stuff, <laughs> essentially, and you have another layer that's really, really thick and it's not got much stuff in, that's telling you those two layers probably had different histories of formation. Um, and it's really crucial for us to understand as much as we can about how sites formed, because it will affect the kind of objects that we are excavating, what's happened to them in the past. Um, and that's that's necessary for just like whole sites, but also for really specific contexts, um, like a burial or a claimed burial. So if you find a Neanderthal skeleton, what's the taphonomy for that skeleton? How did that skeleton get in the site? How can we assess whether it was intentionally deposited is it in a pit well is that a natural pit or was that sort of scraped out by somebody and how you actually answer those questions and sort of critically assess that that is basically what we mean when we talk about site formation and um, and taphonomy and do you find that sites across geographic locations also vary uh, like did neanderthals have different sort of communities across you know depending on where they were um well in terms yeah we didn't really kind of cover like the what neanderthals are in, in mm -hmm. like a chronological spatial context so um they are <clears throat> as i said they're quite recent in an evolutionary sense and um, so we have like the oldest stone tools that we know being made of at all are 3.3 million years old in Africa. So Neanderthals are far, far, far more recent. So they emerge basically as a, as a population that are identifiable anatomically only about 350 to 400,000 years ago. So very much more recent. Um, and they exist through to about 40,000 years ago. So that's the, that's their, their temporal span, but they also have a geographic span as well. So um, right now um, I'm in Wales in the west of the UK um, and we have Neanderthal stuff here. Um, and then we have Neanderthal sites right across into Europe um, down into the Mediterranean, into the Near East region, um, into um, uh, the Central Asia and also in Siberia. So there is a very wide um, sort of landscape span to this as well. Um, and then if you mix those two things up, the time and the landscape span, you have to add in the fact that we have different phases of climate change as well. So over that whole span of time they lived, there were multiple phases of time when it was cold, um, like a, an ice age or when it was warm like it is now or even slightly warmer so through all of that you're looking at all sorts of different worlds that Neanderthals were actually existing in and we do see change through time um, in their technology for example they had different ways of, of taking stone apart of producing the tools that they wanted and we can see long-term change but also little sort of specific specific kind of um entities technologically that appear and disappear through time um and also across space as well so like for example the way that neanderthals in western europe are making bifaces so two-sided stone tools and um, called hand axes sometimes as well the way they are making and resharpening those is not the same as what they're doing in eastern europe or Eastern Eurasia. So there are differences absolutely in, in how they lived and what they were doing. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to this. Um, we have a few questions that I think are maybe a little bit of what you're talking about of people having popular interest. Um, and so it's a lot of people who've read things and want clarification. So we'll start with fire, um, just cause that seems like an interesting question. So Betty Tolkien asks, <clears throat> Did Neanderthals have control over fire? I read in some other book that found remnants of fire in summer, but not of winter. This suggests that they could collect fire caused by lightning, but could not create fire nor keep it going for a long time. Yeah, and um, I think that relates to some arguments over specific um, sites in France, basically. Um, my take on it is that I think 
if we look at how central hearths were to Neanderthals um, in terms of how they organized the sites where they would periodically come back to and sort of living places basically um i think hearths are really important to them and they clearly can control fire um i don't think there is any question about that and um, and i also don't personally think that the evidence that they used fire less during some periods means that they didn't know how to make it because um in some of the layers concerned <clears throat> for example yes there's a lot less charcoal but there is still some and it's not as if there is no fire at all i think it's maybe more to do with that we underestimate um the variation in where neanderthals are doing things so in sometimes maybe they're active inside cave mouths more in other periods when we know from the technology from the way they're moving stone around that their whole mobility system has changed maybe where they're actually doing things and building hearths is also a bit different so i i think it i think i don't think there's enough evidence to say that they definitely didn't know how to make fire basically so another sort of general question um <coughs> so linda morrison so we continue to read about early homo sapiens moving out of africa and into europe we have this very um, clearly stated kind of origin story of our own species where they encountered Neanderthals but where did the Neanderthals themselves come from or possibly? Yeah um, well at the moment um, we believe Neanderthals are an endemic Eurasian species so we don't have any evidence of anything that looks like a Neanderthal from the African continent at all it's all from <clears throat> from Western Eurasia specifically. Um, what we believe genetically and, and also from sort of um, anatomical evidence is that we had a common ancestor with Neanderthals. So there's a lineage that is going to lead to us and to Neanderthals. And that point at which that lineage splits is around um, sort of around 760 to 550,000 years ago. We don't actually know where that split, where the population, where that split happened was based. Um, it probably was not in South Africa. <laughs> um, it may have been in the Near East. Um, that's one possibility. Um, but yes, they are. We have no evidence at all for Neanderthal specifically in Africa. So this next question gets maybe into the sort of interbreeding subject that I know you say that is very popular amongst undergrads. So I'll just sort of read through this. Um, an attendee says, I'm a non-specialist who reads <coughs> Science Magazine. I keep reading about Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other kinds of humans. They coexisted, they exchanged genes, et cetera. And I sometimes suspect that we are doing too much splitting, dividing humans into too many groups. Do you think that there were Neander Neanderthals and modern type humans who did coexist and do you think that they saw each other as different um as like a different species and I also I guess I would just also say like once a, a species sort of interbreeds are they really a different species you know necessarily um like where yeah. are these lines we're drawing mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm, I'm sure you know Julie has some opinions about species and and everything <laughs> like this as well but I mean I, I'll just say you know briefly that um this is highlighting the difficulty of working with fossil populations you know we can't see um in a way that we can with living organisms we can't observe the full geographic spread of that living population we have an idea of where neanderthals were and everything and um, but in a living population you can literally see the boundaries and the interactions and it's quite obvious with Neanderthals until very recently when we had um, DNA, we only had the basis of what fossils look like. Um, and even though now we can see that there does seem to be a long history of different phases of contact and interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, between Neanderthals and Denisovans, between Homo sapiens and Denisovans, um, you know, it looks like when groups encountered each other or populations encountered each other interbreeding was a normal thing but it was never enough that neanderthals and homo sapiens kind of just blurred into one physical population they remained 
anatomically distinct, even right to the end. So it's a complex process. There's, and we don't understand the social mechanisms either. So this question, would they recognize each other as different? Well, what we can say is that there was sex happening. We don't know what the reason for that was. Is it, is it conflict related? Is it non-consensual? Is it just curiosity between groups? But if we look at living creatures, um, it's obvious that very closely related um, animals, um, as closely related or, or even less closely related than us and Neanderthals, regularly do interbreed and hybridize and have offspring. Um, and we can see it in sort of cave bears and brown bears or polar bears and brown bears and things like this. So it's actually normal. Um, and we should kind of have expected it, but it was always dependent on who was around in the same landscapes. So in terms of just like the splitting question, that is going to be something that we have to deal with more and more, the more genetic samples we have. And I think this period between 500,000 years ago and 40,000 years ago, when we know there's multiple hominin populations active and encountering each other in Europe, that's going to be one of the areas that's that's going to challenge people in terms of how we talk about this, how we classify these populations. And that's also true for Africa, where we lack DNA for this period, but we absolutely think it was just as busy um, as, as Eurasia was. And maybe Julie wants to say something yeah. about the, the older species as well. Well, I was just going to say, I think the, the obsession of us studying Neanderthals for the past 100, 150 years is more where we try and distinguish between, and you know, if we say, oh, well, they had communication or they had music. We always then say, but we had, we have true communication or we have yeah. truth. So we try and somehow say, okay, that's acceptable. They have that to some extent based on the evidence, but ours is slightly different. So I feel like we're probably more obsessed with the differences than they would have been encountering each other on the landscape. And, and as Rebecca said, you know, they, they were similar enough that they they liked the other guy even if he didn't have a chin or you know he was much stockier and, and the physical differences that we know from the skeletons they would have been able to you know they would have known that but how they treated each other you know it's difficult for us to to make a judgment on that um and i think how you said about the anatomical differences and the fact that they maintained those for a long time despite the interbreeding uh, does support the idea that neanderthals there was clear interbreeding but it wasn't enough that it wasn't equal um, and that's our current understanding of the the splitting of our two species yeah it wasn't an assimilation you know like mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like oh they're not like the Borg you know <laughs> nobody's being completely assimilated and even if it was a normal thing and maybe it happened relatively regularly um I don't think we've got good evidence that entire subpopulations were mingling with each other at all it's much more kind of, um, you know, individual contexts where there's some meetings um, and things like this. And um, certainly we can also see it in, in bonobos um, versus chimpanzees that mm. there are closest primate relations and chimpanzees are not keen on strangers, but bonobos are quite happy to hang out with other groups that they meet for a while. And there is social interaction and things like this. So, you know, I think, I think we should be expecting that in some cases it probably wasn't involving violence. In other cases, maybe it was. And also the fact that this is over a huge span of time. There's going to be all sorts of different reasons and mechanisms as to explaining why the contact was happening, what the contact actually evolved into and what happened to, to the hybrid children um, in whichever population that they were then raised um, and there's going to be all sorts of different stories. It's not just one. Wonderful. So I'm going to, this is our last question. I think this is uh, our, going to be our last question for the, the talk, but um, Ogden Ross in the audience is sort of gesturing at like, what were they like culturally? So any signs of language or, or pol political processes, like socially sort of hierarchies, that kind of thing, just what did sort of they, what was their interaction like? interaction between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens? Um, <clears throat> we don't know. Um, <laughs> literally, we just have genetics and we have four Homo sapiens um, individuals. We have a couple of cases um, quite late, you know, between 40 to 45,000 years ago in that last period of time before Neanderthals disappeared, the last sort of 
10,000 years or so, um, we know that interbreeding was still happening, even very late. Um, and remarkably, we have individuals where they had a Neanderthal ancestor 200 years, 600 years before they lived, so close to them. Um, and it is a, it's a question, you know, like, would they have known, you know, that they had that heritage? Was it something that was unusual enough that that group would remember it? Um, we don't know that. Um, what we believe is that essentially Neanderthals and Homo sapiens populations around this time were all living very similar lives based around hunting and gathering, um, probably in really quite diffuse levels of population through the landscape. There's not a lot of of any of anybody <laughs> around, um, and what we might expect based on the ethnographic record is that um, <clears throat> certainly for Neanderthals, the archaeology matches this, that they're living in small groups, really small groups, um, you know, less than 20, probably. Um, we can, we have some evidence for this, and I, I do talk about it more in the book, like things to do with like occasional sites where we have footprints, and we can make a rough estimate how many individuals are there, um, or how many hearths there are, once you have ascertained that your layer actually is contemporary and the hearths are not just many different occupations. Um, overall, they're living in small, very small populations, and probably quite regionally isolated from each other, whereas there are hints that there is something a little bit different in the homo sapiens populations where the numbers overall are probably just as small but they appear to be better connected to each other so in, in the genetic sense their their breeding population is bigger so they have a, a stronger more extended social network basically but what we don't know is why um what is the reason for that um and what does that mean in terms of behavior? So, I mean, I, I speculate maybe the ability to maintain longer um, longer distance contacts with people is important, but also the ability to schedule meetings with other groups. If Neanderthals are reliant, indirectly reliant on just chance meetings, maybe um, during particular seasons when they all happen to be around hunting large agglomerations of animals and then they just meet each other anyway and there's no there's less threat because everybody's got food it's a bit like bears when they're hunting salmon you know the aggression is is much less and they they interact more they're not planning to meet each other they're just there um mm. but perhaps with homo sapiens there is an ability to actually schedule things through time and this all of this might be reflected in the the greater amounts of um, aesthetic or potentially socially symbolic objects that we see in the early Homo sapiens record as well. So I think all of that together is, is, is pointing towards a difference. Wonderful. So that was our last question and we are at time. Before I end things, I just want to turn things over to the two of you for any closing remarks. Rebecca, anything you want to leave us with? Oh, well, um, I'm just thrilled to be here and I'm really, really happy that the, the paperback version is going to be out now. Um, it's a little bit bigger than the, the, the UK one, actually, which is <laughs> very American. <laughs> um, everything's bigger. But yeah, no, so I'm, I'm really happy and it's been a pleasure to, to be here and, um, and speak to everybody. And thank you so much to, to Julie for, for being a wonderful um, person to, to have a conversation with. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book and I've enjoyed the discussion based on it as well. I think uh, everyone will benefit from reading it and learning more about Neanderthals and the way we work. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for this fantastic presentation. And thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about this book and purchase Kindred at harvard.com. I put the link in the chat a couple times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Enjoy the rest of your day. Keep reading and be well. Thanks again, both of you. Thank you. Bye-bye.